We last saw Jerry Hall, Joan Gregory, Captain Bradford, and Mrs. Gregory anchored in one and a half miles of water where their stolen Euclidean submarine was apparently quite safe from immediate harm or Euclidean pursuit. Once more, however, the Gregory party has occasion to learn that no one is ever completely safe or free from Euclidea, the magic island. After several vain attempts, they received a message from Johnson, who is in Los Angeles. But Johnson's message was anything but cheerful. Something is threatening the captain's precious formula, and Johnson's message is interrupted by a strange voice. I am fully aware that you are listening, Captain Bradford. You will gain nothing by attempting to conceal your position. Your entire course is watched. I will give you ten seconds to answer me. Ten seconds for the combination of the vault where your formula is kept. Think rapidly, Captain Bradford. You have only ten seconds. Tex, will you answer him? Don't do it. He's bluffing. I think we may safely defy him. We'll risk it, and we won't answer him. But he's had ten seconds. What can he do to us? We'll know in a couple of seconds. You have had your chance. Now you will never see your homes again. Nor will you return to Euclidia. You will never leave the floor of the ocean where your submarine now lies. You have failed. <laughs> Gonna fill up with water. Joan will be drowned. All of you remain in your stations. We will suffer no damage. Isn't there something we could be doing, Joan? Nearly remain in your places. I will do everything necessary. Well, whatever you're gonna do, do it quick. That water looks mighty wet to me. We are now quite safe. You may rest assured that nothing further will happen to us. But, Joan, you said that before, and something has certainly just happened to us. I'll say something's happened, but what was it? The submarine was shaken by violent shocks, just as it was when those magnetic bombs were released from that Euclidean plane. Well, no magnetic bomb ever got down to this depth. You are correct, Captain Bradford. Though the action on this submarine was much the same, we were located by the radio power beam from the island. The power beam? Why, Joan, you don't mean that those scientists are able to send a burst of destructive power along a radio beam. They can do everything else. Then we invited that when we took a chance on answering Johnson's call on the radio. Precisely. But if we were not harmed, what is the effect of that beam? The effect on us is probably negligible, as I was fortunate enough to be able to surround this boat with protection in time to prevent the beam hurting our outer shell to any extent. Though we will find a number of indentations in the metal. You mean that radio beam thing hit us hard enough to put dents in the side of this submarine? Precisely. But, Joan, that would mean that the force of that radio beam was greater than the pressure of this water at a depth of 9,000 feet. It was considerably greater. Well, golly, whiskers! What kind of protection could you surround the submarine with that would keep that kind of pressure from smashing us? The protection is made up of the same elements as the destructive power beam. I merely released several of our magnetic bombs on the course to Euclidia. And the explosion you heard was the meeting of the magnetic bombs and the power beam from Euclidia. But, Joan, that Euclidean we heard threatening us was in Los Angeles. You say you interrupted that destructive beam coming from Euclidia? I don't understand that either. It should be quite obvious. Well, maybe it should be, but it isn't as far as I'm concerned. Does it not occur to you that an agent of Euclidia would hardly have the opportunity of setting up apparatus for the transmission of such a beam in the same room in which Johnson was working? The same room? Yes, Tex. Joan must be right. We heard Johnson's voice. Then he sounded as if he were in trouble. And then this other voice came over our set. It must have been our set. Undoubtedly. But where did that radio beam thing come from? From Euclidia. Oh, I'm beginning to see it, Joan. Euclidia was listening in on our two-way radio talk and getting our position logged accurately. Then when that Euclidean in Los Angeles finished his little speech, they turned on the beam from the island. That would be it, Captain Bradford. And now every scientist on that magic island knows exactly where we are. And I suppose they will start moving in on us from all directions. They will attempt to do that, of course. But we will reach Los Angeles in safety. But we're losing so much time. And Johnson may be in danger. No doubt about that, but we couldn't get there in time to help him anyway. That is true. Mr. Johnson will have to care for his own safety until we arrive. In the meantime, we may make ourselves comfortable. Comfortable? Swell place for it. Now, Joan, as you think our best move is to do nothing for a while... Perhaps you'd take this time to give us a little explanation about that Euclidean fellow who managed to get so close to Johnson in Los Angeles. Yeah. Who is he? I am sure the voice we heard over Johnson's radio was that of Thales, chief electrician.
electrical scientist on Euclidia. Another of those weird names derived from some ancient scientist, I suppose. To be sure. Thales bears his name in honor of the original Thales, philosopher of ancient Greece. Thales lived 2,600 years ago and was the founder of modern electrical research. I thought Benjamin Franklin has quite discovered all that. Well, I'm afraid Thales lived slightly before Franklin. Yes, quite a while. So the Euclidean chief electrician is in our country. It would seem so, Captain Bradford. Thales is powerful. Perhaps the most clever man on Euclidia. Many believe him to be superior to G-47. Well, he's sure got these electrical rays of his trained. If they'll run along the ocean floor for 600 miles and bump our submarine around... You appear to have made something of a study of this man, Thales. Uh, the original, I mean. Have the Euclidians any proof as to how far he progressed with his studies 2,600 years ago? Euclidians have made more extensive research than any other mortal men. Thales was credited with discovering the electron, the Greek word given to common frictional or static electricity. Though there is no evidence to show that he even dreamed of the electron as we know it today. I never even met an electron. <laughs> You've met a lot of them, Jerry, but maybe you didn't recognize them. And I'm as much in the dark as Jerry. Joan knows so many things of which we are ignorant. I can still remember learning in school that Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity. Your schools must be sadly lacking Oh, in I don't know. We get along all right. I think it's a lot better to know that Edison invented electric light than to worry about some Greek who rubbed the cat's back to knock out a few sparks before America was discovered. Thales did not rub a cat's back to get sparks. The earliest experiments were performed with pieces of amber and cloth. Okay, but why? And Thomas Edison did not invent or discover the electric light. He did, too. Joan, are you sure of what you're saying? Naturally. Well, now, let's not get into an argument over it. For all practical purposes, Edison improved the electric light and made it really practical after the invention of the dynamo about 1870. But there undoubtedly were attempts made before that. I never heard of them. In the year 1800, the principle of the electric light was discovered by Sir Humphrey Davy, who made a successful arc light with batteries and charcoal. And that was 47 years before Thomas Edison was born. Oh, I give up. You know too blame much for me. No, don't feel badly about it, Jerry. Joan apparently knows more than any of us. But we can do nicely in our world without quite so much knowledge. You mean we will do nicely in our world when we get back to it. But in the meantime, we're very much in Joan's world. Let's give her a free hand in working this thing out. Is that sensible? What would you suggest, Joan? For the moment, nothing. Huh. I could have thought of that. Nothing is easily thought of, but many people do not know how to do it well. Today. You're certainly right there, Joan. And one of the worst faults we have is impatience. A great deal of patience will be needed before we are safely in California. Now, if you will all remain perfectly still, I will open the beam testing devices in the radio receiver one by one, and we may check Euclidean waves without danger. You mean you will be able to tell if they are still sending out radio impulses from the island? Precisely. And as it makes it very difficult to observe this with our transmission channel closed, we must all maintain absolute silence while I test the various beams. I'll keep quiet. We'll not make a sound until you give us permission, Joan. Go to it. Very well. Silence. Hey, my ears. Stop that thing. Stop it. Jerry, what's the matter with you? Oh, my ears. My headaches. Gosh, that noise. I didn't hear anything to make your headache, Jerry. Just one of those carrier waves Joan tuned into. No, it wasn't. Gee, my head still aches. It's that same note. You remember, Joan? Yes, Jerry, I remember. But you have forgotten. What did I forget? To remain silent. Now our position is definitely established on the island. Oh, Jerry, they heard you over the radio. Oh, yeah. I guess they did. How quickly did you shut off the microphone? Almost instantly. But Jerry's voice undoubtedly was registered at Euclidia. And probably with Thales on the mainland. Now they will know we have not moved since our last message. Oh, gee. I'm sure sorry. But I couldn't stand that one sound hammering in my ears. I don't understand about that, Jerry. I will explain it in a moment. First, I will refuel and get the submarine in motion. Our progress will be slow, but at least we may change our position a fraction of a minute in latitude. Now I will explain why that seemingly innocent sound should disturb Jerry so badly. Well, why didn't it bother any of the rest of us? Oh, that's my keystone note. Your what, Jerry? Joan can tell you better than I can. 
Jerry and I have neglected to explain one Euclidean experiment we witnessed on our way to this submarine. You two managed to learn something every time you get lost on that island. All Pat and I saw was a bunch of doors that we couldn't manage. Well, we got mixed up in them, too. It was when we opened one of them that we heard the old deaf guy practicing music. A deaf man practicing music? I will explain it. We accidentally opened the door of the musical laboratory where Octavo was conducting his experiment. Was that his name, Octavo? For Octavius, who was credited with arranging the musical scale? Mother, you knew. Well, we have learned one or two things, Joan, but go ahead. Jerry and I stood in the doorway, observing the old man as he tapped on vessels containing varying levels of water, sounding a true note with each. At last, he struck the note to which Jerry's consciousness is tuned. And Jerry had a severe headache. Yeah, just like I had when that note came out of the radio. That is being done deliberately? Well, I'd say so. Same principle as a musical note wrecking a bridge, isn't it, Joan? Precisely. And while Jerry may be uncomfortable from the effects of his note, I think we have nothing to fear unless they discover the keystone note of this submarine. Joan, they might find a note which would destroy this boat. More than that, they are sure to find it. Our only hope is to reach Los Angeles before they succeed. And if we don't make it in time? Then a single note of music will end this voyage. <laughs> 